Hello again, we got another video. This one is on the antebellum South. And we're gonna start with what typically called the Cotton Revolution. Um, we're gonna talk about how the South grows and compare that kind of to the North. Uh, for the South, you have these pioneers that are going to stand starting around 1800 up until the Civil War. We get migration into Alabama. We get migration into Mississippi, and that happens typically in the 1830s. And then we get immigration into parts of Louisiana and Texas during the 1840s and 1850s. Now, these early pioneers are generally herdsmen and yeomen farmers. That means that they're independent farmers. And they're forced to move because population growth in the eastern states has cut down how much grazing land there is and how much farmland there is. And their goal is to try and move from a place that looks similar to where they came from. Now what really happens is most of the early pioneers are going to settle in areas that are very wooded, very hilly, and there's not really going to be a lot of opportunity for either slavery or cotton farming. With that being said though, cotton is going to become the primary crop of the South. And for years, the cotton grown in the South is what was known as long state cotton. And that meant that it took a long time to grow and you could only get one crop per year. The advantage to long staple cotton is that the seeds almost didn't exist. In 1793, Eli Whitney is going to invent the cotton gin, and the cotton gin is going to separate the seeds from the cotton bulb and make the process of removing seeds from cotton much quicker. The reason that is important is because it allowed Southern farmers to switch from long staple cotton to short staple cotton. Short staple cotton has a slower, or I should say shorter growing period. It has more seeds, but you can also grow more than one crop in a year. So suddenly we can grow more cotton than we could before. This is going to fuel the English cotton mills over in Europe. This is going to fuel the cotton mills that are popping up in New England. And this is going to fuel the expansion of slavery. Now, this is going to conveniently happen at almost the same time that tobacco starts to decline and tobacco prices start to decline. Now, how much cotton are the English cotton mills using? 70%, that is seven zero. 70% 70 of all cotton grown in the South is going to be going to Europe almost all of the remaining 30% is going to go to New England. And slavery, between 1820 and 1860, over 2 million African Americans are going to be forcibly moved around the South and into places like Mississippi and into places like Alabama. The social relations in the South it was not all like you see in Hollywood. Not everybody was a planter. Not everybody had slaves. And this information actually kind of shocks some people sometimes. You have planters, you have small slaveholders, you have yeoman farmers, who remember are independent farmers, and then you have poor whites. Planters usually defined as owning 20 or more slaves. And they only made up 5% of the population, and that's of the white population. However, they control the largest amount of land, they control the best land, and they have obviously the most slaves. This lifestyle that the planters live, it's very different than what you see in the movies. It's closer to Scarlett O'Hara than it is anything else. Uh, these planters are very often in debt 
They're always looking for better land. They're always looking for more profit, higher efficiency on their farms. They move frequently, which can cause family issues. And the woman of the plantation, known as the plantation mistress, she has this huge responsibility of running the day-to-day -day household. She has to assist her husband. She has to take care of clothing and food. She has to raise the children. And it's not as calm or successful as it might look in the movie. Small slaveholders own less than 20 slaves. And they may only own two or three, but that puts them way above these independent yeoman farmers. So small slaveholders can own anywhere from one to 20 slaves, and they make up about 15 to 20 percent of the white population. These are kind of like the the swing vote, if you will. If a small slaveholder lives closer to the planters, they act more like the planters. If the small slaveholder lives closer to the yeoman farmers, they're going to act more like the yeoman farmers. And that's just because they need to do business with whoever they live closest to. And they don't have as much money as the planters, but they are still often looking for better land and better profits and doing what they can to climb up the economic ladder. The yeoman farmers, the independent farmers, they make up about two thirds of the white population. <clears throat> they own no slaves, but they typically do own their own farms, but they're not very big. 50 acres to maybe 200 acres at the most. They're going to be away from the plantation belt just because most of the good land for cotton has been taken already. They're going to work their own land, but sometimes during harvest season, they can hire or rent or borrow a slave from one of these small slaveholders or a planter. Now, most of these yeoman farmers, their goal in life is to make enough money to become a slaveholder if possible. Then at the bottom, we have poor whites. The poor whites, uh, they don't own land, they don't own slaves, they make up about 10% of the population. Very often they're living on somebody else's land, sometimes with permission, sometimes without. Or they're going to be working on the farms of other people. And the poor whites, they had a reputation for being extremely independent. Now, planters are going to control society. They control how society works. They control the politics. And the rest of white society is okay with it. And that's because the non-slaveholding farmers, as well as the slaveholding farmers, they wanted something from the planters or they wanted to be planters. The small slaveholders were hoping to strike it rich. The yeoman farmers, they might need help from the planters. Poor whites may work for the planters. And white society in general saw slavery as the best way to control what they saw as socially inferior blacks. The idea of paying for black labor would mean that whites and blacks were equal, and that was extremely unacceptable at the time. Slavery was seen as a way to keep African Americans under control since they were inferior. There were many pro-slavery arguments that were proposed at the time. There were arguments that said slavery was good for both blacks and whites. There were arguments that said slavery was okay, it was historical. The ancient Jews had slaves, the ancient Jews were slaves, the Romans had slaves, the Egyptians had slaves, the Greeks had slaves. There, there's this belief that slavery is okay according to both history and religion. 
there was this falsehood that said that slaves in the South were treated better than Northern wage slaves because supposedly slaves were giving everything they need, housing, clothes, food, shelter. But of course, all of that was the absolute worst that they could have. And from the 1830s through the 1860s, Southern churches preached slavery and preached about slavery and the good of slavery all the way up until the Civil War. Now for this week, there is a reading that you're going to read or you may have read already called Cannibals All by George Fitzhugh. That is just a small section of a much larger work where he argues the good of slavery. Now, speaking of slavery, we have to look at slave society. I have here, it says, life as a slave is difficult to summarize, and that's because there are so many variables that go into slavery. Nobody's slave experience was the same as another person. It, there, some of these variables were who the owner was, how the owner treated the slaves, what the slave did, whether it was agricultural work, housework, industrial work. It mattered whether they lived in a rural area or an upper area, upper south area, or if they lived in an urban area or a lower south area. Typically, slaves in the upper south were treated better than slaves in the lower south. Slaves in places like Alabama and Mississippi were treated worse than slaves in, say, Virginia. It also mattered whether there were slaves nearby or not as to what, what sort of culture they were able to create. So slavery is it's very, very complicated. And this is just going to be kind of a general overview. First of all, food. Not much beyond bare necessities. I mean, we're talking pork, cornmeal, coffee, and either molasses or corn syrup. There aren't a lot of nutrients in that diet. Sometimes a slave is allowed to grow vegetables from their own garden, but they could only tend their gardens after the plantation work was done. Some a very, very small number of slaves were lucky enough to be able to hunt for additional meat, but that's fairly rare. The clothing is extremely rough, and the clothing is extremely limited. A slave would get one, maybe two cotton shirts for a male, or one or two cotton dresses for a female. They would get rough canvas pants, mainly, uh, basically like burlap sacks you might find potatoes in or something like that. Uh, it's very rough, it's very itchy. Men get straw hats for working in the field. And shoes, there are no shoes until the weather is cold enough to need them. Housing, this is hard for people to understand, so I'm going to do my best here. Uh, a one-room cabin, basically the size of your master bedroom at home or maybe your living room, 10 feet by 20 feet. So there'll be a door, maybe one or two windows. The windows have no glass. The floor is dirt. The walls are made out of wood. They have to keep out the cold air, the mud is put into the walls. Any furniture there is, usually made by hand, they're sleeping on straw on the ground, much like an animal would, and there's not much to cook with. There might be a couple of pans, a few plates, if they're lucky. Oh, and this one room cabin that's 10 feet by 20 feet, your living room or your largest bedroom in your house, that's not one family, but two that typically share it. So you have people who are 
close together. We're working extremely hard in all the elements, hot, cold, rain, sunshine, snow, you name it. The diet is very poor. You've got no shoes. Disease is everywhere. Contagious diseases spread. The severity of infections is severe. And if a farm got sick, that sickness spread very quickly. There are two types of labor, and I will ask about this on the final, so make sure you do remember this. There is gang labor, and there is task labor. Gang labor is what you typically think of. This is where everybody is out in the field working together at the same time. This is the type of slavery that is most often depicted in movies. Men and women are both working in the field, but men and women are doing different jobs. And gang labor is going to be what is primarily used for tobacco and cotton production. Task labor, individuals have different tasks. Everybody has a different job they need to do. Men and women work separately. You could have people in the same area, but they're doing different jobs. And that's what you find when it comes to rice and sugar is task labor. Everybody has their own individual job to do. So gang labor, everybody works together. <clears throat> task labor, everybody's working individually. The hours are usually long. I mean, we're talking sun up to sun down. Uh, the exact hours do vary a little bit based on the season and how hard the work is varies by season. So as you can probably guess, spring and summer, they're the longest and hardest hours. That's when the planting is done and that's when the harvesting is done. But during the hottest summer days, there are breaks allowed, but no naps or anything like that. In the fall after the harvest, and then winter, you spend time preparing for the next season. You're going to be fixing the tools, preparing the seed, and taking care of the animals. Not all slaves worked in fields. Some slaves worked in households, or some slaves were artisans, people who made stuff. So you could have maids, you could have personal servants, you could have blacksmiths, carpenters, you name it. And in some ways, these slaves were better off, but in many other ways, they had it worse. They didn't have to work in the fields, they didn't have to work in the sun, so they escaped the harsh field work labor. But at the same time, they have to work right beside their owner at all times, which meant that their behavior was watched more, and there can be unwanted sexual advances and sexual assault. So generally, they're better off than field workers, but definitely not always. Now, slaves working in cities, that's, this is a whole different category. Uh, slaves working in cities, they can do household work, they can be artisans, they can do blacksmithing, carpentry, they can work in industry. This is like a whole different ballgame of slavery. Typically speaking, slaves in cities, they're able to move about the city. They're able to do shopping for their owners. They're able to do purchases for their owners. Like I said, some work in factories, some work in mines, some work in the lumber industry. And slaves who can do something such as tin smithing or copper smithing, they're the ones who are worth the most money. Um, Charleston, South Carolina was one of the places where the absolute most slaves were sold. And there's evidence in a Charleston 
auction of an expert silversmith being sold for over $25,000. Today, that'd be a couple million. Now, what about the control of slaves? Um, this might sound controversial, but the physical conditions are not what made slavery so bad. Now, the whipping, the beating, the forms of abuse like branding, caging, denying them food, that is bad. That is extremely bad. Slavery is a bad thing. But like I said, it's not the physical conditions that made slavery so bad. The physical conditions are actually not that much different than what a poor white or some of the yeoman farmers would experience. Where the difference is, though, is the mental aspect, the mental part of slavery. The whipping, the caging, the branding, the denial of food. The physical part of that isn't as bad. Pain will go away. But it's the mental issue, the control. The control over your life, the control over your movement, the control over your future, the control over whether you live or die, the requirement to submit to the demands of your master. That, that is the bad part about slavery. And there was a legal case called North Carolina versus Man. It happened in 1830. This was a court case where the courts decided and ruled that slave owners have absolute authority over their slaves and can do anything they want to their slaves up to and including killing them. Physical conditions, horrible. The mental conditions, these slaves had no control over anything. Nothing. Very famous quote from that court case by North Carolina Chief Justice Thomas Ruffin. The power of the master must be absolute to render the submission of the slave perfect. These slaves weren't seen as people. They were property. They were no different than the cow or the chicken or the pig in the field of the plantation. These slaves, they have no idea about their families. They're separated without, without question. Now, some masters were viewed as good because they treated their slaves as valuable property. But notice the word there is still property. And then some masters were viewed as bad because they treated their slaves as replaceable property. Property again. There is resistance. There's individual resistance. There are purposeful work slowdowns there's purposeful refusal to obey orders. Very famous former slave, Frederick Douglass, he writes in his autobiography about all the times that he tried to run away, all the times he didn't do the work. We have running away, we have theft, we have arson, we have murder. There are also organized rebellions. Uh, Gabriel Prosser's rebellion August 30th in the year 1800. This is in Virginia and it's right after a slave revolt in Haiti has happened. Word of the slave revolt in Haiti spreads to the mainland and Gabriel Prosser, who is a slave blacksmith, uh, he enjoys some freedom because of his position as a blacksmith. Uh, he's gonna plot with his brother to lead an insurrection in coastal Virginia. And Gabriel Prosser, he's going to plan to march to Richmond. He's going to plan to burn Richmond down. Uh, he gets the support of somewhere around 50 to 60 slaves and somewhere around a thousand even knew about it. So it was not like a small secret. When white planters and white farmers in Virginia learned of this plan, 
they execute the people they think are the leaders of the plan, including Gabriel and his brother. The slaves who knew about it but weren't actively planning to participate were sold to the Deep South to places like Southern Mississippi, Southern Alabama, which were the worst places to go. This failed revolt of Gabriel Prosser left whites in the area very nervous for a long time. Then we have another gentleman named Denmark Vesey, or Vesey, and he was a free black. He won his freedom in a lottery. Now, just because he was a free black did not mean that he was equal. It did not mean he was a citizen. He was still a non-citizen. He just wasn't a slave. And he's going to conspire to lead a rebellion in Charleston, South Carolina in 1822. It's thought that as many as 3,000 slaves were involved in either the planning of this rebellion or knew the rebellion was coming. And many of those slaves were from the leading families, the most well-known families in Charleston. When that plan is discovered, the leaders are executed. And then finally, we have Nat Turner's Rebellion, the one that we've already read a little bit about. August 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of 1831. Nat Turner, he was a preacher, as we know, he was educated as a child, and he planned for a long time on how to do this revolt. He thought that it was his mission, his, his destiny to lead this revolt. So he leads this group of about 100 slaves. He tries to get more to join, but they're, they're scared. Uh, he kills 60 white men, women, and children. When the rebellion is finally put down a couple days after it starts, 200 African Americans are executed, including some who knew about the rebellion, even though they didn't join. Nat Turner's rebellion, because it was the largest and it was arguably the most successful, it remained in the minds of white Southerners for years, and it is Nat Turner's rebellion that stopped all education of black slaves and increased the harshness of an already harsh condition that these slaves experienced. All right, so we need to look real quick at the schedule so you can see how just how close to the end of the semester we are right now. So here we have the syllabus page and course calendar and we are right here we are on week number six so we just did lecture for lesson 10 lecture for lesson 11. You have your third reflection paper due this week you had your normal chapter quiz your normal chapter discussions but look at next week We've got the research essay due at the end of next week. We've got the museum review due at the end of next week. Both of those are due by the 26th of July. So I really hope that you are working on these. I really hope that you've made arrangements to go visit a museum. I hope you know what you are researching. If you have any questions or if you need any help on the research essay, or if you have questions or if you need help on the museum review, please email me, I am here for you to help you. Hopefully somebody will take me up on that offer. I'd like to also offer you another extra credit opportunity. Uh, if you send me an email saying you watched all 30 minutes of this video, I'll add five extra points to whatever your lowest quiz grade is for the semester so far. All right, until next time, I hope to hear from you. Bye-bye.